friends. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. This is Indro, and uh, the talk is Water, Wonder Material of the Future and the Intersections of Science, Arts, and Philosophy. I mean, I, I didn't expect that uh, just before my talk there will be such a fascinating talk, and it pretty much aligns with uh, what I'm going to say. Let's, let's see if I can do justice to this. So this is a lotus leaf and a little drop of water on, on it. What is this? This is a massive a monster of a machine. It is the PNH L2350. Its engine power is this massive 1.7 megawatts. Body weight is 200 tons and payload is 72 tons. And it, the scale we are talking about is a massive 20 meters. Okay. Now, if you do the basic math, it you can see that the payload that it carries, the, the it's an earth moving machine is approximately 36% of its own weight. And the operational weight to power ratio is 160 gram per watts. Please kind of remember this, these values because now what I'm going to do is take you to a different scale, reduce the scale a million times, and go to the world of insects. And this is an ant. So, an ant has an approximate power, and by the way, the ants are super weightlifters of the insect world, and it has a power of approximately one nanowatt, say, very small power, the weight of approximately two milligrams, and a payload of 100 milligrams, and what does it amount to? The payload to weight, so is from uh, comparison to 36% is 5,000%. And the operational weight to power ratio is 100 million grams per watt. Now that is massive, okay? And how it happens, why is it that insects are these super machines and they're made approximately almost more than 80% of water? Why is this? Science explains that it is about scaling, because when you squeeze things very small in the order of nanometers and micron levels, what you get is that transformation of chemical energy to mechanical energy becomes extremely efficient. And uh, the losses are reduced. That is one way to see it. The other way is life itself, you know, and its association with water. This is something which uh, has not been understood well. And if you uh, see Paul Dirac, one of the major quantum physicists of our times, not our times, it's before, uh, in 1931, clearly mentioned that uh, it is extremely difficult, the question, the problem of life, and the solution of these problems will presumably require a more drastic revision of our fundamental concepts than any that have gone before. Okay. So in these lines, let's walk together. Let's think about it a little bit. Some water facts, okay? So with 73% uh, of water in our brain and heart, 83% in lungs, 79% in kidneys and muscles, and 31% in bones, we are mostly made out of water. Okay? And, and the rest is proteins and collagens, other material. Now, there are many different amazing properties of water which we do not really understand. It's the most anomalous material that is available. But among them, one fascinating thing that, you know, it fascinates me is that water is diamagnetic material. What does it mean? What is diamagnetism? It means that when you have a magnet, you repel the water instead of attracting it. It is repelled. Uh, and here is a picture or in, in a Japanese laboratory where the water is repelled by an 8 tesla magnetic field. And what is an 8 tesla magnetic field? If you go and buy a very strong magnet, a permanent magnet, it will be a fraction of a tesla. So 8 tesla is quite large. You know, the MRI machines, the magnetic resonance imaging machines, they operate at approximately uh, at a range of 1.5 to 7 tesla. So now, if you think about the biblical story of Moses uh, walking through the Red Sea and the Red Sea is dividing, in order to have uh, any scientific uh, logic behind it, Moses must have been a superconducting magnet. You know, it is all very cool that you know, if you have that same powers, you will be able to divide uh, water, but uh, there's a problem with beer, because if you want to drink it, it will also you know, be repelled. You will not be able to have the beer, so it's not so much fun. 
so the other interesting thing is if you look at your devices all the we are surrounded by electrical machines and electronic devices right and they work on charge carriers which are called electrons right and uh, what is an electron you have a hydrogen atom and you if you strip an electron out of an hydrogen atom what you're left with is a proton it is the positive analog of the negative electron okay so what is fascinating is water is a proton conductor and uh, if you look at uh, so for example electronic conductors are these copper wires for example with which we have all our wirings when you look at your electronic devices electronics is pretty much working on semiconductors like silicon which is doped either negative type or positive type now these are electronic semiconductors now water fascinatingly is a protonic semiconductor and i mean sorry an ice if you make water is a conductor and if you make water into ice it becomes a semiconductor and it can be doped n type or p type by doping it with either acid or a base why is it so fascinating is because uh, it both replicates the electronic uh, uh, the electronic conductors and the electronic semiconductors with which we make our devices and we power our our entire energies so what is also interesting is how this proton protons move within water or ice it is not like as if the water molecules are carrying the protons and moving around okay no there is a very special mechanism called the grothius mechanism where the proton hops from one water to another water as if all of you guys you are water molecules and you are passing a ball you know so this and if you are holding hands then it is a bond and we call this actually it's not really holding hands you are kind of shoulder to shoulder and we call it uh, the hydrogen bonds so with the hydrogen bonds this water associates with other water molecules and the proton hops from one water to another water now it is important because how about protonic devices can we make protonic devices instead of electronic ones because if you take your phone and you throw it into the water your phone is gone okay your phone will be dead but there is something more important that happens which is the water gets destroyed also your phone contains arsenic lead a bunch of bad chemicals also so can we make protonic devices let's think about it at a molecular scale you know very small molecular scale water is like an arrow you have an oxygen at the head of the arrow and at the tail of the arrow you get two hydrogens okay so when you talk about an arrow you can flip the arrow like here is an arrow and you can flip it right if you assign say for example a zero to this up and a one to this down then you may get a kind of a binary logic right and this is what makes function and memory in all our devices let's think about it what are the requirements for a binary logic first is you need what is called a bipolar element it has a polarity it can either point up or it can point down then you have need a bin for zenith uh, <laughs> a bipolar element a bin for separation and confinement why do you need bins because these bipolar elements may wiggle around you know it can maybe fly around so you want them to stick in a particular position which is you need it to be confined but you also need separation if it is entangled like this one is going around and the, it carries the other one so it's not independent so you must separate the two and individually you are able to you know flip the the bipoles so that's why you need confinement and separation and then you need a force field for activating it for example if it's a magnetic system magnetic memory then you need a magnetic field if it's an electronic system you need an electric field so consider a protein and water association here proteins it's making up your body right on all the living systems what is uh, interesting is that when you take the water out of the protein the protein loses its function it is completely non functional so we know for sure that functionality and the repetition of functionality which is memory are dependent on the water's association with the proteins here is a basic building block of of a protein it's a short chain uh, peptide and uh, what you notice is, is that in this peptide you have the hydrogens here 
and you have the oxygens here, there is a nitrogen. So when a water approaches these proteins, for example, this peptide bond, if an oxygen comes in, in the, the, if the water approaches the hydrogen, it will come with the oxygen end, because that is how you form the hydrogen bonding. But when the water approaches an oxygen, it will come with the hydrogen tail. Now, what does it look like? This is, these are confined and separated water molecules, right? So, can we think of beans like this? And what does it look like? Does it look like 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1? That's kind of a binary logic. You know? This is all my imagination. There's no, no scientific proven here yet. But this is something which I personally am opening kind of a window of my imagination with uh, and logic how to, how to understand these. Now, this is what I just shared with you, is, is what I look at and observe and, and find in, in memory in, in a molecular state. But what about memory in bulk water? It's a very controversial subject and it forms the foundation of homeopathy. You remember that homeopathy is a, uh, is a b successful business, but it is completely refuted by science, why scientific studies using vibrational and dielectric spectroscopy say that it's, it just cannot happen. That you take, say, a lake of water and you drop a salt, a, one grain of salt in a lake of pure water, and the pure water lake, it is as if the salt has a footprint, and that footprint spreads over the entire lake, and it takes the footprint of this particular salt. How is it possible? So there is a big controversy about that. Now. What does Eastern philosophy, or rather, you know, Indian philosophy, that's where I come from, say about this? Uh, in India, there are these concepts of gods, you know, we worship them like movie stars. And there are millions of gods, so they're not just one guy, millions of them. And it seems to me that these guys who made these concepts, they conjured up some kind of an image of perfection. They observed something in nature, a snake also, you have, if the snake becomes a god, then you have a snake god. You have uh, the sun, so if the, that is a perfect state, there is a sun god. But then there is also a god, which is the man god, okay, which is about the perfection in man, that if, if man becomes perfect, which is quite fascinating because the guy before, he was talking about the evolutionary state of man, right? And how, how things are changing in our central nervous system, in our brains, and how this kind of evolutionary state is taking place. And it seems that uh, these guys, thousands of years ago, they kind of foresaw that there may be an evolutionary state of man, where the state of perfection. And by perfection, they meant balance and uh, a full expression of the different aspects of man. And by the full expressions, they uh, particularly mentioned four aspects, which, uh, uh, which in balance forms this concept of this perfection, perfect in, perfection in state of man. But interestingly, it is called Narayana. And the Narayana literally translates to Nara, which means sacred water, and Ayana, which means vessel, which basically means the vessel of sacred water, which is in form of man. Now, so this vessel of sacred water has four expressions according to the mythology or philosophy, yogic philosophy, whatever you say. One is this light, it carries a chakra, one is this vibrational aspect, one is this massive aspect, and the other is the aspect of what happened? Vitality. Okay. Now, from a scientific perspective, if I may take the liberty, then the concept of light is very well understood in science as an electromagnetic uh, phenomena. The, con the concept of vibration is also very well understood. And it's only very recently that we are starting to understand mass and its effect, which is gravity. Uh, how mass distorts so-called space-time, which is given by Einstein. And vitality, we don't speak about it, because it's a sin to speak about the vital aspect in science, because science does not understand it, or it's, it's very controversial. But this is the picture that was painted many, many thousands of years ago by some people, and uh, 
with that, just uh, as a, a thought, I would end the lecture by saying that in ancient India, urinating or excreting in water was considered a very grievous sin. So water was supposed, especially the, the uh, river water and lake waters, they were considered to be sacred. And uh, it is up to us, I think, to, to really take note of this because our industries and our entire sewage system, they dump all our waste into these waters which are, you know, the, uh, basically our life depends on, on water. So with that, uh, I hope that we, we, we have discussed certain important points and you will take home with you uh, something from this lecture and give it a thought. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thanks.